The sun was beating down on the baked earth like a merciless drum, and the air was thick with the stench of sweat and desperation. It was just another day in the outback for them, but for me, as an American, it was an unbearable heat, but not as much heat as this case was generating. I'd only been in Perth for half a day, there to visit an old girlfriend who invited me for a few days of nostalgia. Former client, actually, and a cop. I found her husband fooling around, then we began fooling around. We both knew it was just a momentary fling. Still, I enjoyed the invitation, until just this moment. I was laying in my air-conditioned hotel room, dead asleep at five in the morning when the call came in. 5 a.m., my time. 4 p.m., Aussie time. I should have stayed in the States. It was the local police on the phone. Australian cops, and they wanted my help? Ah, so that's why she invited me. Oh well, I guess I left a positive impression. They said three men had vanished without a trace in the Murchison, a vast and unforgiving stretch of land that swallowed up men like a hungry beast. The local cops were out of their depth, and they needed a private eye with a nose for trouble. Yep, she described me to a T. My name's not important. I'm a private eye. I grabbed my hat and my gun from the hotel dresser and hit the road. My rented Ford, kicking up clouds of red dust as I headed north. These guys knew the outback like the back of their hand. I knew it like the back of this rental car, and it stank almost as much as this case. It made my skin crawl. My first stop was the Camel Station, a ramshackle collection of buildings that clung to the edge of the desert like a drowning man. The missing men had last been seen here, and I figured it was a good place as any to start my investigation. I talked to the locals, but they were a tight-lipped bunch. Probably didn't like my accent, or my badge, which didn't hold much weight here, but I flashed it anyway. They knew something, but they weren't talking. I could see the fear in their eyes, the way they glanced over their shoulders like they were expecting trouble. This was a place where secrets were buried deep, and I knew I would have to dig if I wanted to find the truth. I hit the dusty trails, following the tracks of the missing men. I came across a burnt-out campsite near the rabbit-proof fence, a flimsy barrier that stretched for miles across the outback. Rabbit-proof, maybe, but not murder-proof. The ashes were still warm, and I could smell the stench of death in the air. I sifted through the debris, my heart hammering in my chest like a jackhammer on concrete. I found fragments of bone and metal, the unmistakable signs of a body that had been burned beyond recognition. It didn't take a genius to figure out what had happened here. Someone had disposed of a corpse, and they had done it with ruthless efficiency. I knew I was dealing with a cold-blooded killer, but I didn't have a name to pursue. That's when I heard about Arthur Upfield, a writer who'd been working on a novel about the perfect murder. Of course I have to question him. I tracked down Upfield in his lonely shack on the edge of the desert. He was a wiry man with a twitch like a nervous squirrel. I could tell he was hiding something. I grilled him about his book, but he was cagey. He claimed he was just a storyteller, but his body language was telling a different story than his mouth. I found he'd been talking to a man named Richie about how to dispose of a body without leaving a trace. Research, he said, for his book. Richie was a strange one, a loner who lived in a shack near the camel station. He had a reputation for being a bit of a madman, but I figured he might know something about the missing men. I found him sitting on his porch, staring out at the horizon like he was waiting for something. He told me about a young stockman named Rolls, a kid with a mean streak and a habit of getting into trouble. Sounds familiar. Rolls had been seen with the missing men, and Richie figured he might have something to do with their disappearance. I caught up with Rolls in Euonymy, a dusty little town that was barely a dot on the map I was using. You've heard of blank and you'll miss it kind of towns. 
This one might be lost if you think of blinking. He was a cocky jerk, with a swagger in his step and a glint in his eye. He had an answer for everything. I hate guys like that. If they have an answer for everything, they don't realize that makes them look guilty. And I saw guilt written all over his face like ink on a confession. I just had to prove it. I dug deeper and found out that Rolls was really John Thomas Smith, an escaped convict with a history of violence. He'd been on the run for years, hiding out in the outback and preying on the weak. The noose was tightening around his neck, and he knew it, and I was the one holding the rope. It was actually the wedding ring that did him in. We found it in the ashes of the campfire, along with the charred remains of Lewis Karen. Rolls had made a mistake, and did it cost him everything. As I watched them lead Rolls away in chains, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The Outback had claimed three more lives, and I knew it wouldn't be the last. This was a place where the sands of time buried the truth, like the winds shifting the sand dunes here. Only the brave, or stupid, dared to conquer this place. I tipped my hat to the horizon, got back into my stink-filled rental car, and drove away toward my hotel, my mind reeling with the horror of what I'd seen back at that rabbit-proof fence. I knew I'd never forget the missing men or the twisted mind of the killer who had taken their lives. But even as I left Murchison behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The Outback had a way of playing tricks on a man's mind, like mirages in the desert, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was something more to this case that I wasn't seeing. At least not yet. I returned to Perth, a changed man, flew back to America, still haunted by the ghosts of the missing men and the knowledge that evil lurked in the heart of the Outback. I never did meet up with her. I tried to put the case behind me, but it followed me like a shadow, always lurking just out of sight. I'd always think of that case whenever I thought of her. Years later, I heard that Upfield had written his book, The Sands of Windy. It was a sensation, a tale of murder and mystery set against the backdrop of the outback. It was labeled fiction, but I knew the truth behind that fiction, the dark reality that had inspired his twisted tale. I doubt I'll ever go back to Australia, much less Murchison, but I know that the ghosts of the missing men will haunt me forever. They're a reminder of the darkness that lurks in the heart of man, no matter where on earth he hangs his hat, and the terrible price we pay for our sins, and for the sins of others. But I know that dwelling on the past is a fool's game. The Outback is a harsh mistress, and she doesn't forgive or forget. All we can do is try to make our peace with the ghosts that haunt us, and hope that someday the sands of time will bury our sins, and if not set us free, at least allow us to move forward. <laughs> <laughs>